Is there a future for big agencies in China? Now this is Thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. We started last week's show by asking the same question you just heard. Is there a future for big agencies in China? In that episode, David Wolf argued that the 4A global agency model is increasingly inappropriate for China and perhaps other markets. This week on Thoughtful China, we're giving an opposing viewpoint from an executive with plenty of experience running both big and small agencies. Aaron Lau is currently the Greater China CEO of Chail Worldwide, a global Korean network with over 1,000 employees in this region alone, working with brands like Samsung, Hankook, Tire, Orion, and CMCC. He also spent 16 years with Omnicom's DDB Group, leaving there in 2005 as chairman of Asia Pacific, when he started his own agency, Bravo, which was acquired by Chael in 2012. Aaron, thanks for coming in today. You've seen last week's show, and David Wolf's main point, of course, was that big agencies don't operate well in markets where there's an incredible pace of change, um, or there's a lot of emerging trends and a lot of industry upheaval. From your perspective, from a big agency's perspective, do you think that's true? Are they able to respond quickly enough? Well, um, from my experience, having worked for Omnicom for a very long time and also been an independent operator for six, seven years uh, at Bravo, I, I don't think it's a matter of big or small. It's actually um, a good or bad agency. If you look at the 4A model, um, um, as agencies like Omnicom or WPP monetize the system by rolling up all these small little agencies into a holding group company. The issue is whether they put money behind innovating or not innovating. And therefore, it's not a matter of size, it's a matter of will they innovate or will they not innovate. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at, I think David referred to the, as the uh, good old days of advertising, uh, the Mad Men era. It's actually, um, I was at the tail end of that era. I actually seen uh, account supervisors, uh, vice presidents taking the afternoon off, going to um, cocktail bars and whatnot when I started my career in New York. Because in those days, you grew uh, uh, as, the market grow, uh, as the market grew, and, and you basically had maybe 15, 20% growth every year because you have the media component tack on to the agency business. Um, unfortunately, those days are over. So for the last maybe 30 years or so, the big, eight, big 4A agencies haven't quite innovated. So unfortunately, um, the matter is whether agencies will survive or not is not a matter of how big or how small they are, is, is whether they continue to provide value to the clients by way of innovation. But looking back on your experience, when you saw the tail end of that era uh, in your time in China, did you also see something similar to that? Perhaps not as extreme, but back when the Chinese market was growing um, at huge double digit uh, pace, and now of course that started to slow as well. Actually, China never went through that era. I, I started my career in New York, and um, in those days, it was a happy scene because uh, agency personnel are well respected in the industry. Um, the business is growing, and not only are they growing domestically in the U.S., they're also expanding all over the world. So th th those are really good old days of the American advertising era. Uh, when you fast forward to China, I started coming here in 1989, and in those days, multinational agencies are not allowed to have majority control of their own agency. In fact, the best they could do is a 49% equity in the whatever joint venture or woofie that they do. So um, agencies in China never went through that, process, that, that, that era where you can relax and, and whatever. So, um, Chinese agency never went through that um, that process. However, in those days, um, they were without a doubt expatriate were far more valued than local professionals because the market was just emerging. Um, and, and I mean it very kindly when I said emerging. It, it was just beginning. And over those maybe um, the first 10 years since China opened up, it was very, very difficult. I think most agencies were losing money at that time. Uh, including the one that I was running at the time with uh, a substantial amount of money. And then I think it, it was only in the last maybe uh, eight to 10 years that, that the systems begin to emerge as a more um, 
um, um, structured structured market, and and then clients are beginning to go uh, nationwide, um, and then media budgets grow, and then um, uh, consumers. Um, uh, affluence grow at the same time, so then it becomes a real market. So I think actually that right now, this is the period that China is growing leaps and bounds for advertising agencies. Um, and I think um, it's now entering a second phase where now you're beginning to see media becoming more and more powerful. Now you're beginning to see clients are also becoming more powerful by investing in different disciplines and different uh, resources. So agency now is faced with this this um, this uh, paradigm whether they can continue to survive um, or not. Um, and, and as a result, they are now thinking about new ways of growing. Well, it's much more competitive also. Yes, absolutely. Than yes. even just a few years ago. Yes. And when you're talking about agencies that perhaps enjoyed the boom, you know, five or six years ago, really as it was hitting its peak, now they're seeing many more competitors, not just international ones, but also local shops. Yes. So one of the things that we hear a lot from brands uh, as well as agencies is that before they had to deal with other big forays and everyone kind of knew each other and the pitch group was the same. But really, especially when you look at the large national companies and a lot of the big enterprises within China, they're no longer just looking at forays, they're also looking at other perhaps Chinese agencies and saying, is there value here because that agency understands my media buying better than a big foray? And that was one of the points that David talked about. Right. Do you think that local agencies actually do have an advantage uh, in serving local clients? Um, true and false. Um, if you, maybe let me digress for a minute. When I was at school in London, I wrote a paper for my professor and this is going back to the um, late 1970s when London wasn't quite the London it is today. And I wrote a paper to talk about rolling up the uh, fish and chips market. There's a, many, many fish and chip shops, but there's not one single brand. Then when I started my career in, in New York, I also had another, another idea, and that is to roll up all the um, laundromats that was in New York City, and most, most of them are run by Chinese. So, if you look at the Omnicom model, the WP model, and recently I met Maura Saatchi in London, uh, Saatchi and Saatchi famed for you know, coining the phrase globalization and so on. Um, they were the pioneer in a consolidated market. However, um, in that process, if the consolidation is about monetizing a marketplace by grouping these resources together and so on and so forth, um, we're reaching the end of that era. Um, so whether big agencies will survive or not, again, as I said earlier, is about whether they could innovate, taking this financial resources now that they have, and will they be able to develop new technology, new uh, analytics that actually help a client um, uh, fulfill their marketing agenda? I think that is the critical. So if I come back to China, at the moment, most Chinese agencies are generally quite small by global standard. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there are about 204 multinational agencies operating here in China. They take about 34%, 38% of the total marketing spend. There's a, I always laugh about this number, there's another 150,000 agencies taking the other 62% of the market. So um, most of the local agencies at the moment are um, um, not very financially, uh, not, not very well funded financially. Um, and as a result, they find it very difficult to compete. However, um, with digital, with digitization and all that, I believe some of those local agencies will be able to find new ways to compete with the multinational agencies. So it's not going to be just the multinational agencies winning over the local agencies. I think what, are the, what the issues would be is, do you have product and services? Do you have proprietary systems and platforms that allow you to compete, whether it's Chinese or multinational? I think that's the key issue. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, an Omnicom as well and marking the end of an era. Do you really look at the Omnicom and Publicis uh, merger as perhaps the cap of that uh, era, you know, coming to an end? Well, you know, uh, having worked for uh, John Rand for a number of years, um, he's a very smart operator, very financially astute. And certainly Publicis is equally uh, astute in financial matters and all that. And... Um, you know, I think uh, uh, if you look at the agency business, which has changed quite a bit, there is an upstream business and there's a downstream business. The upstream business is about strategy, creativity, and perhaps innovation and all that. 
um, there's been no evidence to prove that the bigger you are, the more innovative, the more creative you're going to be. So I don't really know the upstream business is going to benefit a whole lot from this consolidation. Whereas the downstream business, which is about cost competitiveness, about uh, distribution points and all that, and that's primarily the media planning and buying business. So the, this merger will benefit a great deal from the sheer volume that they would control. Um, and for the first time, they would have enough uh, negotiation power to compete with the Baidu, the, the Google of this world, and so on. I think um, if you look at that, the business from that perspective, uh, the jury is out. Will the Publicis Omnicom merger going to be more of a downstream business, or are they going to have the whole whole egg, uh, or are they going to focus on the upstream and start innovating and, and, and creating new platforms, new new work, and new insights and analytics and all that? That that is um, the unknown factor whether they will continue to prosper or not. But certainly by monetizing or by consolidating, it would take Publicis Omnicom a long, long time to die if they were to disappear. Do you agree with the argument, though, that within China, the downstream business, as you call it, is actually where a lot of the local, especially when you talk about media agencies, have traditionally had more power and much less influence and much less um, displayed capabilities in upstream thinking or innovation? So it seems interesting that they would consolidate and strengthen downstream when traditionally the argument has been a multinational and you go to them for their strategic value, right. for the creative value. Right. So to consolidate for something that seems to offer a lot of value downstream seems like a way to fortify their defenses against local agencies rather than perhaps enhancing their inherent strengths. Uh, well, I think also it has to do with a lot of the multinational clients that are operating here in China. The lights of P&G, Coke, Pepsi, and so on have now grown so fast to the extent that they're now not just looking at the tier one, tier two cities, um, they're now going nationwide. And as a result, multinational agencies are following the footsteps and therefore they need to fit out their store, so to speak, to deliver those services. So I think there will be still a, a, um, a period of time where multinational agencies will continue to be able to leverage that, that, that growth um, and start taking shares away from perhaps the local agencies. However, again, it goes back to the, the, the downstream business is going to be about um, scale and cost competitiveness. And I would also see the Chinese agencies will also begin to go through a consolidation phase as well at some point. Naturally, the numbers that you mentioned were staggering. Right. So at some point in time, there'll be agency groups emerging um, and they will be buying out the smaller players and they will find a way to defend itself. And let me give you an example. If you look at the beer market in China, there are 1,500 beer brands in China. The top three brands take 40% of the marketplace. The top 10 brands take 60% leaving the other 1,490, taking the other 40%. So the agency business is more or less the same. So you're going to have these mega players taking a big chunk of the volume in the marketplace by, by way of media spend. However, on the upstream business, where you're really talking about creativity, nimbleness, uh, insight, uh, and so on, it's, the jury is out whether multinational or local would eventually win out. However, having said all that, the multinational agencies, because they have a number of different companies in the group, so if you look at WPP, they have 59 different companies operating in China, so they would, they, they just by sheer luck, they will hit more jackpots than perhaps other agencies. Well, they've hedged their bets two. with exactly, many, many agencies. Exactly. Yeah. So looking back at your own experience as an entrepreneur and comparing to now, obviously, Chael has a huge operation in greater China, uh, 1,700 right. strong. How would you compare some of the lessons you learned operating Bravo compared to what you're doing now? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, Bravo um, was an independent agency. I owned the company, and we survive on the basis of uh, whether we create value for our clients. Um, sometimes it's about getting my clients promoted. <laughs> sometimes it's about getting market share increase. Um, so lots of different ways in terms of building value for a client, depending who this client is and so on. Um, and at Bravo, we have to think about that every single day, because the day we stop creating value for our clients is the day that we would die. And then you uh, go to a chair or any other multinational model. There are 
invariably um, quite a few clients that you're given uh, because they're globally aligned. And, uh, and therefore, your mindset is not about just creating value. Your mindset is about servicing this client in this location because there's always a master somewhere in the network. I think um, in my experience, um, um, when multinational agencies stop thinking about how do we create value for our client is the day that the, 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 um, the days of the, of the existence of this agency will be numbered because they don't think about uh, why they are in business in the first place. So I think the Bravo experience has helped me in that regard. Well, also client loyalty now, especially in China, is probably at an all-time low compared to worldwide the too, by the worldwide. way. Worldwide, exactly. Um, but especially in China, where right. oftentimes if the lead person on your account is gone or changes, True. Uh, oftentimes the account goes into review automatically. Right. And that's one of the issues that faces any agency working here, but especially the multinationals, which are often pitched against each other. Yes. Do you find now that with the increased competition that clients are also more demanding in terms of pitching and in a lot of cases unpaid or uncompensated time? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, that's just a matter of there are far too many agencies operating in a marketplace like China, even though this is the, now the second largest market in the world, but there are far too many players and there are no um, um, proprietary products that agency sell, so therefore the only way they could do is pitch an, a new idea every other day and so on. And as a result, they, they um, um, I think agencies don't look after the business, the, the, the products that they create. Um, and, the, and because it's seen as the middleman, and the, 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 uh, the fate of the mid, uh, middleman is actually quite miserable, particularly with digitization. The middleman's going to be cut out uh, sooner or later. I think this is also one of the reasons why Publicis and Omnicom look at merging so they can so be insulated from that. Sure. Um, and I think that's the critical issue to what we're talking about here. Um, agencies giving away product because they don't feel their product is that important. It's just a couple of days and maybe um, you know, a few beers here and there and so on and they come up with a new idea and then they will go to a client. Um, agencies need to start thinking more and more about what they're, what they're selling, what they're producing for clients. Um, and more and more they have to think beyond just the product they're producing. And let me uh, for a moment, um, do a little bit of advertising for ourselves. Um, uh, Chao as a newcomer, um, and uh, we have to think about how we would compete uh, as an agency network. And if we just follow the footsteps of the DDB, the BBDO, the JWT of this world, we're always going to be second fiddle to these masters who's been in the business for a long time. So as a result, we think about um, how we would um, produce a, a different business model. And because of our relationship with Samsung, we obviously look to integration as one of the differentiation, but to this day, everybody talks everybody about integration. Everybody says integration. integration yeah, exactly. Sure. So now we're now beginning to build some new ideas. So if you take the latest uh, Grand Prix win that we have, uh, we won the Grand Prix for innovation. And last year, uh, uh, Nike was the winner for the fuel band. Um, they won the Grand Prix of Innovation. This year, we won the Innovation Award by producing a software package called Cinda for creative collaboration. So now we're moving more and more of these ideas that we're producing for clients, and we're looking at areas where we can um, actually add value above and beyond just a TV commercial or a digital program or a website or whatever the, 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 the product that we're producing. We're doing more and more of that kind of thing for ourselves. I think that's, um, uh, again, only time will tell whether we will succeed or not, but that would hopefully start differentiating you know, what we have offered to what other um, agencies are offering. I'll give you another example. Uh, in the digital space. Uh, as you know, we work with Samsung, and Samsung is hugely successful here in China. We have something like 100 million Galaxy users. Uh, about 51 million of them are using the smartphone, the Galaxy uh, S3, uh, S2, and so on. So we went to Samsung and actually created an ad hub, which is basically an app store, because uh, research showed that 70-odd that, uh, percent of the users of Samsung actually sleep with the phone. <laughs> Uh, in the bed. So the stickiness is incredible. So we created this app store as an advertising platform for Samsung because we have access to 51 million pairs of eyeballs just through the phone. And then we have Smart TV, another 3 million household here. So I think we're beginning to look more and more towards platforms so that we could 
um, in addition to doing a good job on insights and creative and integration, which is what expected of us, we're trying to do a little bit more above and beyond what, what, what most agencies are engaged with. But let me ask you, because I also have worked uh, in an agency for many, many years. Ah, okay. And so I understand very intimately the problems with the business model. Right. And when you talk about something like Cinda, uh, we've developed this software package. At the end of the day, does your agency own any of that, or is that still for the client and it becomes something that they walk away with? Okay, well, Cinda is actually owned by us. Okay. Uh, so we own this open source software and we give it out to um, the creative community, the client community for free. Hopefully, we'll aggregate a community and that's when we will probably come in and start charging for whether it's advertising or. Yeah. Sure. But I think uh, we have um, also started to develop APPs and all that. Um, um, so that we could um, add value to whatever our clients do. So, so we're not going to create, for instance, a new football for you know the Chinese soccer league. But that's really not our business. I think BBH is trying to go into the product side of the business. What we're trying to do is trying to look at the space that we're operating in and try to create some products and platforms that are native to what we do, which is creativity and innovation. So those are the areas that we are focusing on. It's something that's a natural extension of your strengths rather right. than trying to dive into something that's right, completely right, 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 unrelated. Right. Right. So in summary, you think that there is a chance for global agency networks to survive uh, within China and worldwide, but it's really more about how they innovate and how they create new value and perhaps even look at new business models in order to compete with local competitors? I believe so. I believe um, uh, if you look at the Chinese um, operators, the agency owners and all that, um, they are certainly very entrepreneurial. A lot of them, unfortunately, uh, never focus on the product because they're making far too much money on the basis of the relationship they have with the client. A lot of them are, are like that. Um, and it's easy money. Um, and this sort of uh, takes me back to the Mad Men era. It was easy money for my bosses in those days in New York, and I believe he goes to the, uh, the pub almost every day. Every afternoon at 3 o'clock, you can find him at uh, Mackey's Pie. Um, and those were the easy, e easy days, and you, you know, it's easy money. And I think China is going through a little bit of that right now with the local operator. Um, however, um, China will, um, will evolve as well. It will be a lot more structure in three, four, five. We're beginning to see all that now happening. And then like any structure market, you can, you're gonna see consolidation both on the media side as well as the agency side. And certainly on the client side, as consolidation happens, the bargaining power of any one particular group is going to be equally substantial. So therefore, what you need to compete with is actually no longer the buying power or the scale of the company. So if you go to any four A's, they all have like four or five hundred people any, anyway, right? And then these four or five hundred people move around every other day. So, so your, your differences, uh, your, your uniqueness, if you like, is commoditized. So I think one of the things agency have to really think about is what is that one product? You can't say, I have a planning model anymore because every agency now have a planning model. Sure. You need to think about what is some of these assets that you have. And that's also one of the reasons why we are building some of these assets for ourselves, whether it's the Ad Hub or Cinda, because we're beginning to realize that we have to build these creative innovation platforms that help our clients' business, but also at the same time help ourselves differentiate in the marketplace. And in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is combine the art of communication with the science of technology uh, because of our background um, uh, working with Samsung. And we're trying to put these things together to give us some proprietary uh, technology or platform or, 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 um, uh, 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 or platforms to, um, to work with clients on. Great. Aaron, thanks for being on Thoughtful China. Thank you. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo, Yoku, and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. We'll see you again.